conflicts between human beings and wild animals. Um, and he's had a tremendous amount of experience. He's been with MDC for 14 years and he's worked on uh, the Peregrine Falcon restoration project here in town. He's on the mountain lion team. He's helped restore um, ruffed grouse in Northern Missouri and prairie chickens in Southern Missouri. He was one of, of the biologists who brought elk back to Missouri from Kentucky. So, uh, and he sees a lot of coyotes too. So we, um, Joe has really a lot of uh, factual information to give us about living with coyotes. Um, I'm Mel, my work at George Owens Nature Park and the nature park is part of um, Independence's Parks and Recreation Department. So we have to thank Independence for this too. Um, and the way that we will organize the webinar is Joe will speak and give us the basic information that he wants us to know. And then we'll do question and answers. And we'll hold the questions until Joe's finished speaking. Um, and if you could type your questions into the chat box, that would be wonderful. Um, so with no further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to Joe DeBolt. And Joe, please tell us about coyotes. Okay, thank you, Mel. I appreciate that. And welcome everyone for being here. I, I just um, East coast to West coast, border to border. Um, it's the most widely distributed species that we have of wildlife. They're a survivor, um, no matter what they do, no matter what's thrown at them indirectly or directly from civilization, they adapt, they evolve, they survive. Um, they're a true testament to resilience by far. And what we have to learn as human beings is they were here first we intruded them because they were here when Lewis and Clark was here. They were here when Native Americans were here. Um, we have basically developed an urban sprawled into their areas. Um, so not are they in our neighborhoods, but we've come into their neighborhoods and they have no place to go when urban development happens, whether it be deer, turkeys, bobcats, coyotes, red fox, it doesn't matter. Even the birds, you take out a certain percentage of green space to build on whether it's homes, sheds, office space, condos, it doesn't matter. You're decreasing carrying capacity and natural carrying capacity in that location where wildlife once existed. And the wildlife just don't pack their bags up and go like human beings can. Wildlife fight for territory far worse than human beings ever thought about. So as much as you don't let a stranger in your yard the wildlife are the same way when it comes to their territory, except it's much more advanced and worse um, in cases where they will oftentimes fight to the death over territory. So with this coyote mania that we see everywhere, um, it's imperative that we just educate people and continue to educate people on what's happening, why it's happening, where it's happening. And what I can say for Kansas City area, particularly the suburbs too, uh, my office is down at the Discovery Center, which is two blocks from the Country Club Plaza. We've got coyotes on video surveillance down there, just strolling through the Country Club Plaza. So if they're in the Country Club Plaza, I guarantee you they're in people's neighborhoods just as well, because that's about as inner city as you can get. So what they're looking for is basically everything that's on your, that menu. And that includes pretty much everything except human beings. Coyotes are very opportunistic. They will eat plants. They will eat meat. They're omnivorous. They're not just carnivorous. Um, they love apples. I've seen them eat the innards of pumpkins many times. Um, so gardens are not, you know, protected from coyotes because coyotes adapt. Um, they will scavenge such as roadkill deer or roadkill raccoon or something like that. The coyotes will scavenge on that. Um, and basically 85 to 90 percent of a coyote's diet most of the time is of small rodents. It's, it's mice, it's voles, it's moles, things of that nature, ground squirrels, um, smaller size rodents. And they will take a rabbit coming into the rabbit venue of size. That's where you get into a coyote distinguishing domestic house cat with a rabbit. 
coyote doesn't know it's a rabbit and a coyote doesn't know it's a cat like humans know to distinguish between rabbit and cat coyotes only distinguish between size and profile but they don't know the actual word rabbit or the actual word cat they just know what they're looking for so when they come across the cat it's the same size as the rabbit that is prey size that's what they want and being opportunistic they are not prejudiced against anything um, they'll take anything that because they're they're really you know looking for food all the time and that's what's made them so adaptable and such a survivor is because they don't say no to anything when it comes to food so whether it's blackberries in the wild or a squirrel out there in the wild they'll take either one of them what we have to do as humans is look at that and say well what are we offering the coyote that we don't realize uh, whether it be our garbage is left out whether it be we're feeding birds outside and there's a bunch of bird seed on the ground and it's attracting birds and squirrels and other prey size items that coyotes look for whether that be our dog or our cat that goes unsupervised out in the yard and is not on a leash or it's outside the fence or there is no fence so looking at that um, knowing the opportunistic capabilities of a coyote how quickly they can go after food and get it um, any type of attack can happen in a heartbeat if they're in range or they're in the neighborhood what i want to get across to everyone is i want to eliminate the, the fear that people have the fear that human beings have when it comes to seeing coyotes on their premises people are already bigger than the coyote so act bigger than the coyote be bigger than the coyote let the coyote know this is my domain not yours it's your yard it's your house and you wouldn't let a stranger come in your front door any day of the week so why let another stranger come into the yard any day of the week so just be bigger than they are because you already are physically bigger than they are. And that what's, what's really giving the coyote no fear is the fact that they're having no negative reaction from the, from the human. They don't get a negative response from the human. Um, what they're teaching folks to do out in Denver and St. Louis is trying to do a little bit of this is when they see a coyote out in the yard or just adjacent to the yard, people will go out and make loud noises. They'll beat on pots and pans. Some of them will use fireworks um, where it's permitted in municipalities. Um, some of them will put rocks in an empty milk jug and shale. They'll just make these loud noises to try to teach the coyote that he's unwanted there. Um, and that's for people that are just absolutely don't want to tolerate them or don't want them around. Um, uh, the, the, the biggest scenario that I see is the fact that we have so many unsupervised dogs and cats. Uh, we have bird feeders that leave seed on the ground and excess birds everywhere. That's another thing that I try to teach folks is I'm a, I'm a heavy bird feeder. i believe in feeding birds, but I do not, just because of my education, I don't believe in feeding birds year round. I personally will feed birds January, February, and March, because that's the three toughest times of the year. Other than that, birds will absolutely find food resources throughout those other nine months. Um, but January, February, March is the worst problematic time period for wildlife other than any other time of the year. That's where it also comes into the coyote. The coyote is seen more often from January to May than any other time of the year. And the January, February type of situations like we just went through is mainly because You've got the, the deepest dark depths of the winter where food resources are very, very rare. So they're hungry. It's cold. They have to eat in order to maintain body heat to stay alive. So what they're doing is searching for food at a higher rate. Their activity levels exponentially increase. That's why people see them more often. And then that coincides directly with their breeding season. 
So when their breeding season comes and keep in mind, when wildlife have a breeding season, it comes once a year. That's it. They get the chance to have courtship and reproduce once a year. Imagine if humans were restricted to once a year, what a frenzy that would cause and our type of activity. So you can only enhance that when you're talking about wildlife. Um, so the coyotes activity ramps up because you've got all these females that are ready for courtship. Plus the fact that you've got limited food resources out there and people are seeing these coyotes that appear to be either threatening or they're not afraid of us. And like I said before, they don't have any reason to be afraid of us because we haven't shown them anything in the urban areas that should make them fear us. When we start standing up to them and start being bigger than them and not tolerating them, then they will have something to fear. But up until now, they just don't. And there's really nothing like to call us, Missouri Department of Conservation, nothing we can do. We've got, like myself, I can trap coyotes all day long. Have done it, been there. And I can do it for farmers out in the country. I can't come to your place and trap the coyotes that you see because everything I use to lure that coyote in to get in that trap, I am going to catch every cat and dog that comes along. And I catch someone's cat or someone's dog, the professional that's out there doing the job for someone is going to get fired and the irresponsible pet owner is going to get rewarded. That's just the way society is. So I can't do anything as much as I want to. I feel like I could come out and catch coyotes. I'm pretty sure I could, but I'm also going to catch the dog or the cat. It's, it's guaranteed and it's, in, it's inevitable because no matter what municipality I go in, what neighborhood I go in, I see dogs and cats running loose in all of them. So there's nothing that we can do other than try to educate folks to coexist with them, understand why they're here. Uh, and furthermore, protect your pets, supervise your pets. Do not let them go out alone um, and unsupervised because uh, that's just like ringing the dinner bell. And there's a lot of other predators out there than just what we're talking about today, the urban coyote. But uh, the, the coyotes live around us and the red foxes live with us. Um, and most people don't realize that, but the red fox is the one that's living with us all the time while the coyote's living around us because the red fox is not tolerated by the coyote. If the coyote sees a red fox, it will kill it if it can catch it because that is a direct source of competition that is competing for the same food, same prey that the coyote is and the coyote won't tolerate red foxes. So they actually have the red foxes pushed right up in our neighborhoods, underneath our decks, underneath our porches, behind the shed, under the swimming pool, under the patio. And that's where the red foxes are getting away with it and just getting a little bit of a barrier from the coyote because the coyote just simply, they, they won't tolerate a red fox. So that's another thing you can watch for and you'll probably, you'll probably see red foxes sooner or later. Um, and they're being pushed in from the coyote. And that was my, that was my master's thesis um, quite a while back but uh, it's happening everywhere. Um, but this coyote, um, it is resilient and it, it really does not pose a threat to children or adults in any way, shape or form, because that's just not the profile or the size of what is on their menu here in Missouri. I mean, a full grown deer is not even on the coyotes menu in Missouri. Coyotes, if they're gonna take any type of a deer, it's gonna be a deer that has been mortally wounded through hunting that the hunter never recovered or it's going to be deer that was hit on the public roadway. Other than that, a coyote's going to, not going to take a deer unless it's like a fairly newborn fawn. They will prey on fawns. Um, but so you can see where size really comes into play. Um, what I do for farmers in the country, um, when I help farmers, the coyotes are usually killing calves or they're killing goats or sheep. And when it comes down to it, it's usually small. It's, it's small calves, it's, it's lambs, and it's small goats. It's not full-size livestock. Um, so you can really see that coyotes really concentrate on size. And when I talk about dogs, I usually am talking about the toy dog group when it comes to food for coyotes. 
it's the Pekingese and the Poodle and the Shih Tzus and things of that nature that's in the toy dog group um, that really has the possibility of being looked at as prey from the coyote. Whereas the sporting dog group or the hound dog group, um, you know, your, your retrievers, your Labrador retrievers, things of that size, a coyote's going to look at that dog and feel a threat because that's a canine threat for territory and competition. So if a coyote gets a little bit vicious or if it, if it's interested in the full size dog, it's usually from a threat standpoint um, because a coyote's trying to claim that territory and the dog's claiming the territory too, because the dog does the same markings that the coyote does because it's built in the canine system to do the same type of markings. So you've got a, you've got a competition factor going on there that the coyote may or may not tolerate having the bigger dog around but cats across the border on the menu there's there's no cats that aren't on the menu when it comes to domestic house cats they're all on the menu a red fox would take a domestic house cat so um, but dogs are a little different because of size variation um, but going back to this fear um, i just i just don't see a reason why people should fear them because they're they're not here to eat us and the, the, the coyote is just here to do its thing and, and it's roaming the yards and it's roaming the neighborhoods looking for food because not only do they know there's wildlife around, but there's also domestic animals around and there's also human beings that leave food behind in garbage cans um, and litter on the sides of the roads so they can they can find food all over the place just from how we live. Um, but uh, the, the the coyote is just something that you don't see very often because they are so elusive. So when people see them, they get alarmed. And then, like I say, it's usually during those times of the year when food resources are really low um, or we're in their breeding season. And when those two things coincide, it really amplifies their activity. And it also elevates the amount of sightings. I have people calling in all the time that they're seeing coyotes and it really stands to reason during those times of year. Um, another thing I would tell folks that is kind of fun and it's educational is there's not very many people out there who actually really truly know what goes on in their yard during the nocturnal period. In other words, at night when we're behind closed doors, do you really know what's going on in your front yard, in your side yard, or in your backyard? do you know and the best way to educate yourself and to figure that out is to get what's called a trail camera you can get them cheap you can get them expensive and all that is is a camera that's going to take pictures outdoors that runs on double a batteries by motion or heat detection you can get them in any pretty much any sporting goods section of any retail store but you put a camera out in your yard about the height just above your knee on a small tree on a fence post let it sit there for a month and you'll be amazed on how much education you will receive on what goes through your yard at night and the more and more you educate yourself on that whether it be a raccoon a possum a skunk sometimes you may see a bobcat um, you'll see coyotes at night you might see an armadillo um, but you stuff that you never would have fathomed would be there in the dark. You educate yourself and get yourself in tune on what's going on in your yard. You're going to be less apt to be surprised when you see it in the daylight or there in the near future after. So that's just one thing that I try to get folks to do is put cameras up out there because it's it's really inexpensive to do. And you can plug those SD cards into your laptop and see what pictures are on there. Some of the some of the cameras have a system that they'll send the picture right to your phone immediately. Um, but it's it's cool surveillance in your yard, um, even for the other things that we don't want, such as you know human invaders. So, um, and usually they're camouflaged or they're a color that's not that doesn't really stand out. So. That's just something else as a, as a side bit to do that, that can really educate you on what's happening in your yard in the dark, because most people don't know that. I'm going to shift a little bit on, on the breeding side where the coyotes get into having these litters. And that's usually in May 
And sometimes we see early litters in April. Um, but that is also a period because we're out of the cold weather and food resources are more available. But what happens there is once these pups are weaned, they have to go to hard food. And coyotes, the male and the female, they feverishly go out and try to find food because they've got several mouths to feed. They could have six, seven pups to feed. Um, so they got to constantly bring food back. So during that, those months, April and May, um, which coincides also with the red fox, um, the red fox have to bring a lot of food back to feed those little foxes. Um, and the coyotes are doing that too with the coyote pups. So it's uh, another time period when you see a lot of activity and people notice them more than they normally do. And it's just because they're out more than they normally are. Um, they're very active. They're trying to find food and anything goes when they're trying to raise pups. Does, does, um, I, I don't have, I mean, I realize we've got a pretty limited group here tonight, but I don't, I don't want to go in too much depth on this. Um, the, the main thing I want to cover here is I don't, I don't feel the need that people have to fear this animal. I, I just, that's one thing I wanted to make perfectly clear with this talk is this, this fear of the coyote or this, this thought that you feel threatened for the coyote um, that, that shouldn't exist because we don't, we're just simply not on their menu. And the more we let them do what's being done right now, the less fear they'll have of us. Um, and, and the more threatening they'll come across because they're not getting a negative response. They're not getting anything from the humans that, that makes them fearful. Um, and that's where humans just got to stand up and protect their domain, take care of their property. Like I said before, you wouldn't let a stranger come into your front door. So why let one come into your back door? Um, so just take care of the pets, watch the pets because the pets will tell you everything and the coyotes watching the pets too. And all that other stuff that is just added bonuses for the coyote to be around the bird feeders that are attracting all these birds and squirrels, which they eat all the excess seeds sitting there, which they eat all the garbage sitting out, which they eat. If you feed a dog or cat outside all that food constantly going out there, they will eat. Um, so just picking up after ourselves and keeping the place clean. So they have no reason to come around other than passing through. Um, don't give them the reason to hang up and investigate further. But uh, that's the that's the main thing. I mean, I'm going to give the Nature Center here. Um, this is one of our publications we put out. I know I did an article on this. This is the conservationist in March of 2019, and it's 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 on Metro Coyotes, and the. Uh, other one that I have is Missouri coyotes and how to deal with them. So I'm going to give both of these publications in bulk to the nature center here in independence, and they'll have them for you to pick up whenever you need them. And we also have them at our offices. If you want to call our offices, we can get them to you. Um, but that's, that's pretty much all I have. Um, I, I don't want to prolong this and I don't, I don't want to uh, get too deep into compensatory reproduction or anything like that. Um, I just want to keep this simple because I know that there's got to be people out there with questions. And that's the main thing I want to do. I want to answer people's questions. So um, if we start in the chat room, I will conclude this and then we'll go to questions here momentarily. Thank you. I hope I'm, thank you very much, Joe. That was interesting. Um, if anybody has questions, would they please type them in the chat room and then I'll kind of relay them to Joe. Um, and I hope we're not getting feedback from this. So let me know if we are. Um, let's see what our questions are here. Um, well, I don't see any questions in the chat room. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, Megan is asking, what is their gestation period and how long do the pups nurse? Gestation period is around 60 days and the pups will nurse approximately three weeks, maybe, maybe pushing four weeks, depending on how many of them there are, how big that litter size is. You're welcome, Megan. What 
type of fence will keep them out, Joe? So if you have your typical chain link fence or, or any fence that, that has small holes in it. And by small holes, if, if everyone understands, not everyone may understand this, but there's woven wire fence that will work as well. Um, but basically what I, what I do, everybody knows what, what size a coyote is. So you can visualize what a coyote can go through as far as mesh sizes of a fence and what it cannot. So then you have your fence and I like to go five feet some people would say six feet, but I think five feet is enough because you're talking 60 inches. And then I like to be six inches in the ground or something, some sort of penetration into the ground. So the fence is not right at the ground surface where the coyote, because coyotes are good diggers. So they can't dig underneath it and go straight under over time or overnight. Um, so I like the fence to actually be in the ground several inches just to basically detour anything from burrowing under. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Um, there's another question. Are coyotes vectors for disease? You know, the, the biggest thing that I see as far as disease in coyotes is mange. We don't, we don't have a documented case of rabies in Missouri on coyotes, but mange, and I, I think someone chatted in in a question about mange. Mange is something that I've seen quite often in the past years in the Kansas City area, and that's a that that's that's parasitic, um, and sometimes mange is terminal. Sometimes it'll get the best of the animal, and then again, I've seen animals that were completely bald. They have lost all their hair, all of their fur, all the way through the tail. The animal was completely hairless and no fur whatsoever, just skin. And they look so much different when you see an animal like that, that you don't, you can't even hardly identify it because they look so much different. But that's, that's from that, that mange and mange is a problem and mange can spread to red foxes. Um, and I have people often call about, you know, can mange be contracted to my dog or something of that nature and generally not because we don't see any type of heavily contact between the dog and the coyote or the dog and the red fox um, where the little foxes get it and the coyotes get it is being inside that den and being nurtured and raised in the den before they leave the den the parasites inside the den and then it's able to get it on the little ones, and that's how they contract it. But uh, mange is the worst by far. Joe, what about rabies? Are there coyotes with rabies in Missouri? We do not have a documented case of coyotes with rabies in Missouri. Our rabies in Missouri is generally with skunks. Um, part of that question about um, a coyote with mange is, are we just supposed to let nature take its course? And then um, another part of that question is, I'm assuming MDC would not attempt to trap it. Can you comment on that? Nature taking its course is probably the number one value that MDC has. And... <laughs> I, I have used that phrase so much because there's times when we want to help, people want to help, and whether it's an individual or a group, um, it is it is by far better to let nature take its course it's on something like mange. There's no way can go out, no way we can go out and encapsulate and find and detect all of the animals with mange out there. Um, too hard to do. And then on an individual with mange. It's just easier. It's, it's so hard to set up and try to trap an individual uh, when there's so many individuals around. And we already talked about trapping in the urban area. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about is cage traps. And you will see propaganda and misinformation, uh, false information um, from if you go into farm and home stores and see these live traps you'll see a great big jumbo live trap. 
that will have a picture of a coyote or be labeled for coyotes right on it. I promise you, you won't get a, a coyote to go in a live trap. I can catch a red fox in a live trap and I can catch a bobcat in a live trap. The coyote is the Einstein of the wildlife community. It's not that stupid. It's not going to walk into a cage. <laughs> um, so that's something where, you know, we talked about trapping before the traps that I can catch coyotes in successfully with high efficiency. I, I just can't use because of the, the domestic dog and the house cat. Um, so n let nature take its course is quite often the thing to do, especially in the urban area, just because of we've got so many other things to deal with that we can't take the risk on. Um, there's another question. We have lots of squirrels. Will they increase coyote activity? I think everybody has lots of squirrels. Yeah, everybody has a lot of squirrels. Everybody's going to see a paradigm shift before too long that's not being talked about very much, but I am, I am screaming about the paradigm shift we are about to see, um, and it's coming very quickly. But the squirrel populations are plentiful, and Cons it's, it makes common sense to me that if you have a viable food source, you're going to have predators. Um, but I'm not particularly worried about the coyotes. I, I, I'm sure it would attract coyotes, but most of that's going to attract raptors. It's going to attract red-tailed hawks and sharp-shinned hawks and Cooper's hawks and things of that nature because that's what they prey on a lot of. I've got a Cooper's hawk nest in my yard. And I watched them bring, last year, I watched them bring 11 squirrels and five snakes to the nest. So it's just, um, you've got squirrels, it, squirrels on everybody's menu when it's, when it's the predator out there, whether it's avian or terrestrial, the squirrels on everybody's menu. So if you've got a lot of squirrels, you've got predators of all kinds more than likely. Here's a question about coyotes breeding. Have you, uh, do you know about them breeding with any other animals? Well, when the, the when I was talking before about the hound group and the sporting dog group and talk about that being considered a direct threat for territoriality, there's something else there that could go on. Now, most of the time with today's, you know, today's day and age with people and their dogs um, most people have their dogs basically spayed or fixed um, but there's something to be said about a female dog that is of labrador retriever size coming into heat and coyotes picking up on that and that attracting coyotes because that is still canine and attempting to breed um, there's been research in the past done um, that has says that's been successful. It's a very low percentage of success, um, but coyotes, I mean, that goes back to one, the one chance a year, like I mentioned, one chance a year to breed. Um, so that amplifies all that type of sexual behavior. So if you've got a domestic dog that comes into heat, and it's still in your family. It's still in your basic, basically it's instilled your species of race. Um, they're going to try to attempt to breed it if they can. Um, Cause they're, they're here for one reason, just like everything else in wildlife. They're here for one reason. That is to continue their population. That's the only reason they're here. Um, and so that's where it comes in survival of the fittest with natural selection. That's why this works so well with wildlife because natural selection will select the fittest animals. You don't want a bunch of weak and inferior animals doing your breeding. You want the fittest of the fittest doing your breeding, the best genetics, the best survival survivability traits that there is. That's who you want doing your breeding. Um, and so that's, that's what makes natural selection and survival of the fittest so great because that's what keeps these populations strong with great genes for future. We're going to shift gears with a question now. I'd like to, um, someone that really appreciates coyotes and says, I'd like to see and hear coyotes in the wild. Where can I do this without interfering in their livelihood? 
Well, you don't have to go very far. I mean, you can hear coyotes. I, I hear coyotes in Buckner. I've heard coyotes in Green Valley. I've heard coyotes, and I'm thinking Eastern here because I've spent a lot of times on the Eastern side in the evenings with uh, a lot of the beaver work that I do. But Oak Grove, Bates City, Green Valley, Buckner, uh, Blue, Edge of Blue Springs, Adams Dairy Parkway, Remembrance Lake. Um, no, the, I've heard coyotes there before. Um, so you don't, you don't have to go very far. And usually the, the best nights are those nights where the wind lays down right at dusk from being 10 or 20 mile an hour. And it just lays down to nothing. And you'll hear the coyote serenade start when the wind gets calm and the night it's really quiet. Um, that's generally, and generally clear skies is, is most, most often the time when they'll do it, when you've got, you know, starstruck skies. What, Joe, what about along the Little Blue Trace, like, uh, that follows the Little Blue River? Absolutely. The, there's nothing, I mean, I wouldn't count out the Country Club Plaza if you could sit there. The, the problem is when you get in the city, the, everything is drowned out, like, like much like being along I-70. So much is drowned out by motor vehicle noise. Um, so you can't really hear the sounds of nature, um, whether it be after dark or at dusk, because of the motor vehicle noise on, on busy roadways. Um, that's the biggest deterrent there. But you get away from that, and I would not count out anything. Great. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, but I I do have a request. So from what I get from your talk, uh, summing up, the only thing we really have to worry about with coyotes coming into our neighborhoods are our small pets. So, um, so uh, cats and, um, and smaller dogs. Is that, do you have like uh, how many pounds that a coyote would just walk off and leave alone because it's too big or? <laughs> I, I hate to venture a guess on that because every coyote's different. You know, there's nights where I want a 30 ounce steak and then there's nights I want an eight ounce steak. So <laughs> it's, uh, I, I wouldn't put a poundage on it, but I would go more by size. Um, what, what, how they relate size to what they're looking for, um, to other wild species that are their prey. Um, I, you know, they can kill a red Fox with no problem and everybody knows the size of a red Fox. Um, so that would be a little bit bigger than your toy dog, but not as, not, not as big as your sporting dog group. Um, probably not as big as your hound dog group. Um, so they can kill that with ease. Um, but, uh, the, the biggest thing is if you've got a fence, you're, you're fine. If you've got that, I would go as far as if you've got four feet of fence, coyotes are lazy. They don't really want to work a lot. Jumping four feet over something's a lot of work. Um, so if you've got a fenced in yard, I would say most of your problems are taken care of by the fence. If you don't have a fence, I would go with the, with the dog or the cat, just be there with it because we don't, I haven't seen an attack that's happened on a dog or a cat from a coyote right at the base of a human's foot. I've never seen it. It's always happens when the pet is away from humans. Interesting. So does anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask from Joe before we wrap up here and even even if, if i see something come up i'll let you know joe but i want to say thank you so much um i've i've really enjoyed it i think i have a lot of advice i can give people now about um actually kind of quieting their fears really um and i um could you ad address one thing can we you know, occasionally somebody says I'll shoot it or put out poison bait. And um, I'd really like to know what your opinions are on that. Well, that's how the people in the country handle it. Um, straight up. That's the, that's the truth of the matter. 
Um, but the people in the country, they are not restricted by city code. Um, and here in the city, um, shooting at something, while it's going to remove the problem permanently, it's not going to do much good by alarming neighbors and getting law enforcement involved. It's just not a good road to go down. Um, but, the, you know, that, that that's what restricts a lot of people from trying to take care of what they need to take care of in the city on all wildlife is um, the city code restriction on discharging a firearm. Um, so go, going to traps and things like that is what people do. And that's where this one species is the outlier because we just can't trap this animal like we can. We can get everything else in a live trap, no problem, but not the coyote. So it's just the gun, you know, the gun is just not something that is even feasible to try to do inside the urban area. Right. What about poison? Poison's illegal for all wildlife. Yeah, I mean, you cannot use poison under any circumstance. And I just want to, I just want to reach out to everyone before we start losing participants that if there's a subject, a topic of wildlife um, that anyone wants to do with just a short segment like this in the future, let Mel know. And I'm more, more than willing to talk about anything that you all want to have problems in your backyards or whatever, um, all the way to what bird feeder should I use? If you want to do anything, let me know, let, well, let Mel know, and we'll do another segment on this on, on any topic you want. Okay, I love that. <laughs> this is Mel, and I, I, I think we might get some real positive feedback on that one. I would love to do that too on some of the animals we have questions about. Um, so thank you, Joe. I'm gonna tell everybody, we'll, we have recorded this session. It'll be posted on Facebook and YouTube, Facebook at the George Owens Nature Park page. YouTube, I am, am imagining we'll put something like coyotes in the neighborhood is what you would look up. Um, and it should be there within two days. Um, Joe is bringing me some of those brochures on coyotes, the issue of the Missouri conservationists and then how to, how to live with um, coyotes in Missouri. And I will have, those will be available at both, both buildings. So we have the new DeWitt Nature Center and the old lodge, which is where I am. And you can pick those up there. So um, without further ado, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. And I hope your interactions with coyotes are all pleasant ones from now on. Good night. Thank you all. Take care.